Once upon a time. Welcome to Australian Book Lovers. Your destination for imagination. A big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us once again for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission, as always, is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature spanning a whole range of genres to book lovers all around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I am Darren Kazanko, dystopian science fiction and horror author, reader, of course, and one of your hosts and co-founder of Australian Book Lovers coming to you today from Corner Country. And I'm Veronica Strachan, aka V.E. Patton, uh, reader, writer of children's picture books, sci-fi and fantasy, coming to you today just for somewhere completely different from the lands of the Yuan people in southern New South Wales on the Sapphire Coast. Well, this is it, isn't it? Episode number 70, woohoo, and you woo-hoo. are on a bit of a holiday, hence uh, I maybe a, a slight to change in your voice <laughs> on the recording, but, and, uh, well, what a time to be holidaying, right, when, I guess, we It's pouring <laughs> with rain. Yeah, yes, exactly. It is, I'm absolutely, not going to you know, sugarcoat it, it. It is, yeah, and my heart goes out to all the people who are struggling with floods and, you know, being uh, out of their homes and all those kind of things, and animals and crops and all those things. It's a bit of a tough time in Mm. many parts of Australia at the moment. But the Sapphire Coast is absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, the rain can, it can bring with it some pretty negative aspects, but at the same time, when the sun comes out, it's going to be beautiful and green and and hopefully it is an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Rebuild if that's the case, or but uh, but yeah, nonetheless, a bit of a holiday for you. And so, number 70, it's an excellent uh, number. We're only 30 away from the magical, mystical 100. And uh, did you know what number 70 signifies? Tell me about number 70. Well, apparently, it signifies contemplation, spirituality, rest, sensitivity, mysticism, mastery, and sympathy. And it's also considered a spiritual number that indicates gaining knowledge from personal experience. So um, I'm sure you're gaining some knowledge and enjoying some personal experiences on the south coast of New South Wales. Absolutely. Absolutely. I am. And of course, uh, knowing that the bingo call for 70 is three score and 10. It's a little wow. bit hard, but there you go. <laughs> so at some point there was an accountant that was calling out bingo numbers, I'm guessing. <laughs> Quite likely, quite quite likely, yes. Well, being episode number 70, would you like, I mean, we're heading into the groovy 70s now, the time of Led Zeppelin and Skyhooks and all the cool rock and roll. Would you like to know a little bit about Australia in 1970? Indeed, tell me about 1970. Well, here's an odd one. Did you know that Queensland Labor Senator George Georges, or the cool name, but uh, anyway, he rejected oil company assurances that drilling in the Great Barrier Reef could be done in such a way that the reef would be preserved in an untouched state. So, well, there you go. Someone had a bit of common sense there, and I don't think it was the oil company. So, obviously, uh, we've still got issues with the Great Barrier Reef, but imagine what that would have been like if we allowed oil companies there. Mm. And now their National Development Minister in 1970, Reg Swartz, announced that an Australian team was in San Francisco. I found this really interesting. So we had an Australian team in San Francisco drawing up specifications for Australia's first nuclear power station that Mm. was to be stationed at Jarvis Bay. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, But there we are, 1970, we're already looking at the prospect of a uh, nuclear nuclear power station, which is really interesting. I didn't know that. Now, also here, this is quite quite cool for, well, we've got a uh, special guest in our Reader's Lounge this episode who doesn't we want have. a bit of mystery. Yes, and I've got a very a new, exciting. Yeah, so this is a bit of a mystery. Canberra police in 1970 investigated possibly dangerous chemicals that were thrown into the pool of then Prime Minister or the uh, Minister Gordon, Gorton, I think. Um, so yeah, the mid- Prime Minister's Lodge, which appeared to then eat into the tiled walls of the pool in which the Prime Minister swam every morning. So lucky someone <laughs> sussed that one out. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a pretty bad chemical, but uh, considering it lands in water and still is strong enough to eat tiles, um, someone didn't like the Prime Minister, I suspect. Mm. Uh, but 
Mr. or well, Prime Minister John Gorton bounced back and, well, he didn't swim, so he was all right, but he announced that the federal cabinet had accepted the recommendation of a Senate Select Committee for Australia to adopt the metric system of weights and measures. So oh, I thought it was earlier than 1970, but was it 1970 mm. that uh, we, we adopted that metric system? I have no idea. Thinking I'm that thinking. I was in about grade four or five when they stopped teaching us um, inches, feet and yards and furlongs and started teaching us centimetres and millimetres, which made a whole lot more sense that the decimal was way better than, than imperial, um, particularly around weights. Although I find that I still sometimes do a little bit of both in terms of recipes and that kind of thing. So yeah, probably about right. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just a metric kid. I've grown up with metric. Uh, yeah, See, that's, so yeah, well, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> well, what I can tell you is uh, something a little bit close to home for you. In mm. On the 1st of July, 1970, the Melbourne airport was officially opened. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, yes. And that made a lot of sense for us because we live in a northern suburb where the previous airport, which was the state airport, Essendon, the planes used to fly over us all the time. And I remember our cousins coming up from Toronto, from Gippsland, you know, where we've just gone through, and being amazed that they would run out to the backyard to look at the airplanes. We'd go, what, what are they doing? But they'd never seen an airplane, so there you go. Oh, wow. But with Telemarine, it meant they didn't fly directly over us, which was good. Oh, there you go. So you could say <laughs> that uh, as of the 1st of July 1970, many residents of Melbourne enjoyed the serenity. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but also in 1970, um, Wilshire, the, the knife company, so in Australia at least, uh, they developed the self-sharpening knife. What a cool invention for Australia. That was a miracle. It was a miracle. Woohoo! I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess... Uh, do we do you get still sharp stay sharp knives now um, yeah it can still count oh well, maybe it's just that we got one when we got married like 37 a uh, few years ago and it still works <laughs> it still works and yes. that's probably why they don't get sold anymore probably because <laughs> it's yes, a one time purchase they made them too good <laughs> too good and that is a little snap snapshot of 1970 in australia because of course it's celebrating episode 70 so what a fantastic opportunity and I think maybe we should jump into some news in a minute, but I understand. First of all, I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to tease the meanings and origins of Australian words. Oh, yes, of course. We, yes. Beauty. We're up to G for Galah. Oh, G for Galah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so Galah comes from the Uwalaray and related Aboriginal languages of northern New South Wales. So in early records, it's variously spelled as G-A-L-A-R, G-I-L-L-A-R, G-U-L-A-H. Uh, the words first recorded in the 1850s in European uh, records and of course it's a bird uh, for those of us who uh, you know don't know the birds referred to is the greyback pink breasted cockatoo Eolophus roseocapillus which occurs in all parts of Australia except the extreme northeast and southwest and it's also known as the red breasted cockatoo or the rose breasted cockatoo so there you go Hmm. Um, usually appears in a large flock, has a raucous call. They, yes, they, my niece calls them the bad boys of the bird world. Uh, and it was perhaps this trait, the raucous call, which term, produced the term a galah session, which was for a period allocated for private conversation, especially between women in isolated stations over an outback radio network. So there you go. I don't know if I've told the story before. Did I tell you the story of my galah or cocky? No, I don't think you have. So I bought him from a neighbour, and yeah. I, I don't—I'm not really a fan of birds in cages at all. But they—they—they yeah. they, they need to get rid of him. So I thought I'll—I'll I'll try and make his life as pleasant as I can, uh, and mm -hmm. I was tempted to let him out. But he had a because, of course, the cockies can sort of talk a little bit, and he used to when you walk past his cage, he'd—he'd he'd run up and rub his neck and head against the the cage and go cuddles 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 mm. and that was um so you had to give him a little scratch under the uh, the chin or on the side mm. of the head, and uh, he was so cute. One day he said, cuddles, cuddles, cuddles. I said, yeah, of course. And then went to give him a little scratch and he launched onto my finger like a <clears throat> bird possessed, attacked my finger. And by the time I ripped it out, <laughs> my poor little nub was all bleeding and flesh was ripped. And that was my guitar pick finger too. So I was, oh. so, so, I was so angry, <laughs> but, uh, and this has gone back a bit, but so I threw him, <laughs> this is, I suppose, a pretty Aussie story. I threw the galah in the back of a panel van yeah. Went, down, went down to a pet shop, sold him for $30, and then went straight to the guitar shop and bought a uh, music book for my favourite heavy metal band. <laughs> <laughs> so, And that is my glass story. 
Well, sorry. Okay. I'm going to tell you that uh, perhaps she was mad at the gum tree full of galahs. I, I, I suspect you so. Made a, made a proper galah of yourself? <laughs> um, many a time. Because that time. is, of course, you know, you know, commonly in Australian English, we, you know, use galah to refer to a fool or an idiot because, yeah, that's kind of the birds. They always look like they're having a good time and messing about. So there you go. Hmm. I'd like to tell you about G'day. And I think that people around the world will probably recognise that in Australia we do say G'day, which is an abbreviation of, of course, Good Day. Uh, used frequently and at any hour. It doesn't, in fact, have to be uh, during the day. So it's recorded from the 1880s and, of course, came to prominence in the 1980s through the tourism advertisements that um, comedian Paul Hogan invited people around the world to come visit Australia and say g'day. I think I was saying g'day a long time before Paul Hogan, but that's okay. Uh, there you go. And look, here's one that I don't know. So my final G word for today, which, of course, is from... School of Literature and Languages and Linguistics at Australian National University. The final word is Gilgai. Have you heard of that? Mm, I can't off the top of my head, no, but it okay. does sound somewhat familiar at the same time. So I'm looking forward to hearing this one. All right. So a Gilgai, G I L G A I, is a word which describes a terrain of low relief on a plain of heavy clay soil characterised by the presence of hollows, rims and mounds as formed by alternating periods of expansion during wet weather and contraction with deep cracking during hot, dry weather. So this type of terrain is described as gilgade. A single hole is known as a gilgai or a gilgai hole and such holes are also known as crab holes, dead men's grave or melon holes. And the word comes from Wiradjuri, an Aboriginal language uh, once spoken of a really vast area from southern New, South, southern New South Wales to northern Victoria and Gamilaray, which is an Aboriginal language spoken over a vast area of east central New South Wales and extending into southern Queensland. Gilgay Waterhole uh, is recorded from the 1860s. So there you go. Hmm, interesting. Hmm. It sort of, yeah, sort of rings a bell. For, so I knew it had something to do with geographical sort of descriptions. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to think back too, prior or pre Paul Hogan advertising, I'm trying to think if G'day was ever something I said or was was in the lexicon of Australian slang because, at least for me, I, I, mean, I think now it's used as a recognition of being a cliche. So if yeah. I see someone's like, yeah, g'day, mate, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> you kind of, you put it on, but it's, um, yeah. I'm trying to think if, if yeah, I, I guess it must have come from uh, Australian slang at some point. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Did... He, he was just bringing out the ochre in all of us. So it was already about, but he really made it, you know, well, he became that national icon, didn't he, to uh, be the comedian and be... You know, hoax as he was, painter from the yes, from the and uh, the old uh, Paul Hogan showed some very, very memorable skits on that. <laughs> it did it did? <laughs> All right, time for some news. Absolutely. So, shall we jump into the news for episode number seventy? Yes, let's do, do, do it. Do, 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 do. Coming back with a little more news, and I must admit, having been on holidays, that I haven't got a whole lot of news, but I wanted to tell you, share some of my news. So first of all, just to let you know that SL Lim won the 2022 Barbara Jeffress Award, and this was for Revenge, Murder in Three Parts, which was published by Transit Lounge Publishing. And the judges said, in choosing Revenge as their winner, we firstly discussed the almost painful sympathy we felt for the protagonist, Yanni, Yanni uh, beg your pardon, while other books on our shortlist were also emotionally involving, particularly the books by Down, Jansen and Wilde. So, you know, they're great books. So check out the shortlist and, you know, have a read of those. We felt that revenge edged ahead of these due to the freshness of its setting and the relevance of its messages to everyone. None of us could recall reading a recent novel set in Malaysia despite its proximity to Australia, nor one dealing with the ingrained sexism that robs girls and women of the chance to live a full life. So there you go. There's a little bit more, but you can have a look on the ASA website. Uh, and yeah, it, it kind of, I thought that was good to have a little read of that because it getting people connected to the characters in story is something that we kind of, yeah, I think when we talk to uh, our guest author in our interview later, that this will be something that we can have a bit of a look at. Second mm. piece of news, I just want to recommend that people, wherever they are, please go and avail yourselves of the opportunities to have 
Aboriginal cultural experiences. So we're up here on the Sapphire Coast and we went to see the Durunu Muru dancers uh, and had this experience celebrating the whale season and learning about Yuan country and culture. And it was held down the beach, the Kokora Beach. These are saltwater people and they had a range of dances. They were teaching uh, the young children to do some of the dances and they told the stories and they told the, about the culture and they told about whaling. And it was just brilliant sitting on the beach listening to all of these fabulous things, smoking ceremony, everybody partaking in the healing. So I absolutely implore everybody, if you can, jump in and find somewhere to be a part of the healing that's going on. So there you are. So thank you to all of the Daruna Mirror dancers from uh, up here in Marimbula on UN country. The, the UN people have always had this great cultural connection to Wales and it's fantastic. So very good. That was my news. No, ah, well, of course, my news. Well, my news is I don't really have any news. But my news is, uh, as you you know, Veronica, I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago and suddenly got uh, turfed into the uh, the full time, you know, hustle and bustle of the city and doing a, sh a bit of a short term contract, which has seen me away from my computer for most hours of the day at the moment. Well, in front of another computer, but alas, it's not mine, and it doesn't have the horror movies playing on the screen beside <laughs> it. So, you know, it's taken a bit of getting used to. But lucky, it's only a. <laughs> Very happy about that. Yeah, short term thing. Uh, but I'm so I don't have much news for this episode, but I am going to for the next episode. But I'm curious, how many whales did you see? Ah, so we went out today in the rain, but out through the uh, the sandbar. And the first ones we came across were down at oh, one of the points. Uh, you know, geography is not my strong point. We saw three males and because most people say, well, you know, are they really playful? Well, they're playful on the way up for the summer where they do their breeding. And of course, it's being the East Coast, they're headed up to the, the Gold Coast and, you know, up to, to Brizzy and that kind of place where they breed and birth and do all of those kind of things. And then this time of year, August to November, they're just migrating back down to Antarctica so that they could feed on the krill that's underneath the ice. And I can, you know, say that because they're all... Uh, guide was fantastic so three that we saw and we followed them and they you know came up and breached and you see they were baleen whales so that was what we saw and oh humpbacks thank you just asked my expert over there on the couch humpback whales which are the baleen ones so they just you know the no teeth you know no danger there but they were just brilliant they would spout would come up up they'd come and they'd have the beautiful tails flapping away and then on our way back, we saw another young one having a lovely time smacking its tail all over the place. And then coming back again, another very young one swimming quite close to the coast. So it was pretty good for a rainy, miserable day. It made it worth going out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm. I mean, obviously, we get to see a, a few whales, depending on what time they use down this way. Um, yeah. So very, yeah. very lucky, usually, when they've got their little bubs with them. Uh, but they're just a just magnificent creatures aren't they absolutely and, magnificent yeah. yeah and i don't know how i'd feel if one popped up next to the water or next to me in the water that's for sure because they're just yeah they're pretty awe-inspiring the, the size and i think that's uh if you spend a bit of time in the water i think that's one yep. thing that uh, takes a little bit of getting used to sometimes is like, if a big you know for example even a dolphin pops up out of nowhere it's yeah a big, it's a big fish it's a big yes. animal. Sometimes they look bigger than you are. Well, they are bigger than you. Yeah. And so to go from a, you know, you're in the water where really 90% of the time you don't see anything to yeah. suddenly an animal that's bigger than you pop up, it's uh, let alone a whale, that's got to be amazing. Yeah, and so. they are as big as the boat that we were on. So, yes, it was uh, it kind of, you know, puts you in mind. And we were, even with the, the you know, a fully laden boat, we were something like 20 tonnes and the, the whale's 50, I think, or something like that. Yes, yes, I'm getting the nod from my marine geologist on, hmm. on the cans there, so that was good. So they're fantastic. I've, I've, I've never heard a whale song. I've, I've heard plenty of, like, dolphins. Uh, when mm. you dive underwater, you can hear them in the distance underwater. Mm. So you know if the dolphins are there, you can hear their clicks and their, like, little cries, and it would be so beautiful to hear an actual yeah. whale song underwater. But uh, who knows? Maybe that will happen sometime this year. I'll have to uh, spend a little bit more time underwater. And of course, Antarctic yes. ice, that may, icy waters may play a theme in your chat today with an author, but we'll get to that one uh, very yes, shortly. Yes, indeed, indeed we shall. So 
you know, have you got any more news? Otherwise, let's just jump in. Well, my news is I don't have much news for this episode. Okay. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm learning some fantastic new things in the city and, of course, having a bit of an adventure. Yep. So, but I'd love to step into the, uh, the the cafe, the Reader's Cafe, So because we've definitely got some new books on the website. Excellent. So we, excellent. Time for a coffee. Okay, Veronica, what sort of cafe are you in today, considering you are in a bit of a rainy run on the south coast there, New South Wales? Yes. But uh, did it inspire you for any beautiful cafes you've been to? Or Well, yes, there is a vegetarian cafe in Marimbula, the only one. And even though many of the cafes are struggling to get staff at the moment, it was lovely to go there today and the staff were friendly and I had a lovely piece of uh, vegetarian quiche. In fact, it was delicious with little falafel salad on the side and some really nice onion relish and i had a lovely cup of chai with a little honey so that was delish oh nice well my cafe is more of the uh, grab and go hustle and bustle yeah. just to celebrate what about yourself yeah yeah the hustle and bustle of the city you're back again for a, a brief moment before i can uh, put yeah. a put a, yes. uh, a pin in that one yeah, so yeah so well no not a, not not doing the, doing, doing the full-time stuff so but yeah so grabbing the coffee grabbing the coffee sorry walking and you know soaking up the sounds and the traffic and the, the buildings and the hustle and bustle and everyone in a hurry to get wherever they are that they don't really yep. want to be and it's all fun so yes grabbing a coffee but uh the uh, we've got some fantastic titles and that yes. i'd like to share over we've a coffee so we'll sit back and relax. Yeah. yeah so the first part i'd like to tell our listeners about is called the tilt by author chris hammer and Chris Hammer is quite a prolific writer and uh, yeah, well, I had the pleasure of talking with him very recently, so uh, our conversation with Chris will be coming up very soon. But he is a mystery and crime writer, an Australian, and uh, he's been a journalist and a foreign correspondent and documentary maker, so all sorts, so a really fascinating gentleman. But his latest release, The Tilt, reads as follows. A man runs for his life in a forest. A woman plans sabotage. A body is unearthed. Newly minted homicide detective Nell Buchanan returns to her hometown, annoyed at being assigned a decades old murder, a file and forget. But this is no ordinary cold case, as the discovery of more bodies triggers a chain of escalating events in the present day. As Nell starts to join the pieces together, she begins to question how well she truly knows those closest to her. Could her own family be implicated in the crimes? The nearer Nell comes to uncovering the secrets of the past, the more dangerous the present becomes for her as she battles shadowy assailants and sinister forces. Can she survive this harrowing investigation? And what price will she have to pay for the truth? And that is The Tilt by Chris Hammer. So, hoo hoo hoo, sounds very, very, very cool. Definitely, I like it, the darkest secrets lie closest to home. Yes, yes and uh, <laughs> yes, and always something, there's something really cool about returning to your hometown or something along those lines. And, yeah. you know, uh, I guess uh, maybe unresolved issues have to come to the forefront, but uh, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so, uh, the reviews are already, I mean, it's only just come out, but the reviews are fantastic. And uh, at the time of when I had an opportunity to talk with Chris, he was actually on a, a national book tour. So. I'm sure that uh, a little bit of uh, typing on the keyboard will find many an interview with him. He's a fantastic gentleman, but that book is uh, definitely tearing up the charts, and that is The Tilt by Chris Hammer. But sticking with mystery, I'd like to introduce a book called, well, this one's an interesting title, How to Destroy Your Husband by author Jess Kitching. Okay, mm. I'm intrigued. Yeah, so <laughs> am I. So I'm going to have to pick a few pointers up from here and hide uh, very strategically. So. Yeah. I gulp as I stare at the stranger before me. Who is this man I had wanted to spend the rest of my life with? Cassie Edwards swore she'd never fall in love. Then she met Jamie. He changed everything and Cassie's never been happier. But with less than one month to go to her wedding, Cassie discovers Jamie is cheating on her with his colleague. Blinded by rage, Cassie makes it her mission to seek revenge on the pair. When Cassie looks deeper into her fiancé's life, she soon realises being faithful isn't the only thing he's lying about. As her hunt for the truth takes her to some of the darkest corners of the internet, Cassie learns just how little she knows about the man she shares her life with. 
it leaves her wondering one thing. Is Jamie someone she should destroy or someone she should fear instead? How far would you go to destroy your husband? A revenge-based thriller exploring the themes of toxic masculinity and the impact of betrayal, How to Destroy Your Husband is a book sure to get readers talking. And that is by author Jess Kitching. So, mm-hmm. whoa. Okay, um, that's pretty crazy premise. I mean, do you destroy or fear? And uh, yeah, wow. How far, I guess, would you go to destroy your husband? I hope, for my wife's sake, not very far. Um, but I could understand maybe some days why she might want to destroy me. <laughs> but no, so a revenge-based thriller. Um, yeah, sounds fantastic. And I, I, I'm understanding that that's a brand new release as well. So definitely jump on to the mystery, uh, mystery and thrillers genre on the website you'll find both the tilt and how to destroy your husband there now to go a little bit away from mystery and crime romance author faye hall has just uh, uploaded another book to our romance section and this mm-hmm. one is called impassioned deceit now this one is i think it's gonna get everybody who loves romance they're gonna want to grab this one so would you risk your life for the one you love at 32 Hannah Wagstaff's scandalous past and the scar it left her with has made her a spinster, scaring away any offers of marriage. She had given up on love until by chance she was reunited with Patrick, a man who had lit a flame in her heart years ago before disappearing from her life. Patrick O'Doherty couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Hannah. He had been certain he would never see her again, but there she was, and this time he would do anything to keep her in his life. Things take a drastic turn when Patrick's vengeful stepfather starts demanding ownership of the cattle station that was left to Patrick by his father. Suddenly, Patrick finds himself on the run for his life, trying to uncover the secrets of his stepfather's past and the reason he will be willing to murder for a cattle station. Hannah is distraught when she's told Patrick died in a fire. Her grief continues when her sister is kidnapped without any clue to who could have taken her. Months later, when her sister returns, Hannah goes looking for the culprit. What she finds is Patrick, alive and working as a bartender at a hotel. Passionately reunited with Hannah, Patrick discovers that not only is his life under threat, but hers as well. What secrets tie their families together? Will he be able to protect Hannah? Or will his love for her ultimately cost him his life? And that is impassioned deceit by romance author faye hall which you can find under our romance genre on australian book lovers so ooh, quite a complicated little bit of love there yes yes sounds a little bit of thrillerish in there as well mm, imagine and thinking some, someone you loved was gone and then going to a bar and finding that person that's uh yeah that's got to be a interesting sort of premise to get into yeah yes 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 So, if you're done telling us about some of the new ones, I wanted to tell you a little bit about The Secrets of a River Swimmer by S.S. Turner. Well, I think that'd be perfect because, of course, you had the wonderful opportunity to chat with uh, Mr. S.S. Turner for today's episode. I did, and and he was a delightful gentleman and uh, a great author, so very, very happy to chat with him. Secrets of a River Swimmer, a beautiful, funny, life-affirming novel. As Freddy gazes at the majestic river gushing past him in the depths of a Scottish winter, he's ready to jump in and end his life. But what happens next is not what Freddy expects. From the moment he enters the river, Freddy starts a journey which is more beautiful, funny and mysterious than he could have imagined. And through this journey, Freddy's story becomes interweaved with a cast of unforgettable characters who are equally lost and in search of answers. Eventually, they all unite in their quest for an answer to the biggest question of them all. Will the river take them where they want to go? Hmm. Yeah, so that's Secrets of a River Swimmer. And it has actually a beautiful review on the cover where Heather Morris, who wrote the number one New York Times bestselling um, The Tattooist of Auschwitz, she wrote a profound story that is all about our lives. I cannot recommend it highly enough. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's assume. amazing. Yeah, far yeah. out. So uh, Simon Turner, who writes as SS Turner, has been an avid reader, writer, and explorer of the natural world throughout his life, which has been spent in England, Scotland, and Australia. Just like Freddie in his first novel, Secrets of, Re- of a River Swimmer, 
He worked in the global fund management sector for many years, but in recent years, he's been focused on inspiring positive change through his writing, as well as trying not to laugh in unfortunate situations. He now lives in Australia with his wife, daughter, son, dog, two cats and ten chickens. Oh, okay. <laughs> not to get too explicit, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I suspect then maybe you had a bit of a chat about chickens. Well, there was there was some chicken talk. Yes, indeed there was. I can't help that. So let's turn to my chat with S.S. Turner, author of The Secrets of a River Swimmer. Well, I like secrets and I like finding out secrets. <laughs> Do you so like I'm swimming in freezing it. cold Scottish rivers though? Let, let, let's hear how mm. that all came about. To be confirmed. But yes, mm. let's go. This is going to be fantastic. Welcome, book lovers, to another fabulous interview. And I have with me today Simon Stewart Turner, who writes as SS Turner, and he is the author of Secrets of a River Swimmer. Now, Simon is going to introduce himself in a moment, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit about him from his website. He tells us that he's been an avid reader, writer, and explorer of the natural world throughout his life. And just like Freddie in his first novel, Secrets of a River Swimmer, he worked in the global fund management sector for many years, but realized it didn't align with his values. In recent years, he's been focused on inspiring positive change through his writing, as well as trying not to laugh at unfortunate situations. Uh-huh, we might need to talk about that. He now lives in the Sunshine Coast hinterland with his wife, daughter, son, dog, two cats, and 10 chickens. So welcome, Simon, hello. Thank you, Veronica, very nice to meet you. <laughs> And Simon, tell me about the traditional owners of where you are living and writing at the moment. Yeah, so I'm called, I'm speaking to you from Gubby Gubby Country, which is Sunshine Coast. We're in the hinterland, so in the mountains near the coast, about half an hour away. Beautiful. And of course, listeners, I am coming to you from my usual place, which is Warrior Run Country, down here in the mountains of Victoria. Secrets of a River, a river Swimmer. It was a bit of a tongue tie there. Let me say that one more time. Secrets of a River Swimmer. So what inspired you to write about Freddie and the river? That's a good question. Yeah, so I left Australia uh, to go traveling when I was quite young. So early 20s. And my family are uh, English. And I had this, I just wanted to get to know my family better. Mm -hmm. So I moved to London um, early 20s. And then that kickstarted an amazing time in my life where I traveled lots and had interesting job opportunities. But it's fair to say if there were, if there was an Academy Award to be given to somebody for becoming lost as a person, <laughs> I think I should have at least been nominated. All right. <laughs> I was quite lost. So I uh, found myself living in Scotland um, mm -hmm. and met my, my now wife and we we're full, hopeless romantics, and we basically bought a castle in the <gasps> middle of nowhere, wow. about an hour outside of an hour outside of Edinburgh. And the Scottish climate is pretty famous for being dire, so uh -huh. like cold, <laughs> wet, dark, a big portion of the year. So I was, we're living in the middle of nowhere. Climate wasn't really uh, sort of what we we're after, and. I was in a career with people who were just focused on money and not not m matching with my values like mm -hmm. kindness and, mm -hmm. and passion so i was officially off track <laughs> yep and one of my closest friends at that time called me up and he's he basically said he was in a similar position and he and, and we looked at a map because he said why don't we catch up soon we looked at a map of where we were both living and it was basically split by the River Tweed, exactly mm -hmm. halfway between us. And we met at the River Tweed one day and we decided to just jump in, even though it's a famous uh, salmon fishing river, not, not for swimming. Mm -hmm. But, we, but we, we jumped into the river and it was freezing cold and we oh, nearly got killed by the, by the rapids. Did you <laughs> suffer from hypothermia? <laughs> <gasps> but we survived and we yeah. had an amazing time it was just wonderful it was uplifting joyful and we ended up basically getting to the end of that experience and just saying this is for us mm. and then we did that for about once a month for seven years 
Wow. And so that was pretty much all my time in Scotland mm -hmm. was, was sort of focused on that sort of stuff. And then my wife and my uh, children and myself, we moved to, we returned to Australia in my case a few years ago. And it was sitting inside me, this, just this missing of the river and this story about the joy and the clarity and the euphoria mm -hmm. river swimming was giving, had given me and, you know, all of the, I guess the life-changing benefits it had offered. So yeah, it, it's, it's led to this story being inside me and it just grew into something bigger like they're sort of allowed to jump onto the page. That's how, that's how the novel came about. <laughs> that's how it came about. And there is obviously so much more to it than just two blokes going and jumping in the river and, you know, layering about a bit. Can, there's deeper meanings and there's, you know, perhaps some uh, allegory there, but have you continued swimming? Let's go that way first. Is there a river close to where you are up there in Gubby Gubby country? Yes, or actually, well, although crocodiles, you know, what have you got up there? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, no crocodiles. Okay, but we, okay. We've, we're lucky to be near the coast. And yep. I, all through the year, even in winter, I go swimming. But it's not quite the same as sort of the close to zero yes. uh, you know, de uh, degrees that we sort of swam in in Scotland. Definitely so need to come south, here. Simon. Come yeah. down and swim with us in Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did get my scuba license in Tasmania when I was uh, living and working in in Hobart down there. At um, but we had a I had to have a wetsuit, of course. Full wetsuit was like a thirteen mil one. It was very hard to walk, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that was probably equivalent to Scotland's rivers. Mm. Yeah, in, indeed. <laughs> yeah. So now tell me a little bit about the story, if you can. I'm going to introduce readers to it. Let me just um, share the blur with your readers. So Secrets of a River Swimmer, which is Simon's first book. As Freddie gazes at the majestic river gushing past him in the depths of a Scottish winter, he's ready to jump in and end his life. But what happens next is not what Freddie expects. From the moment he enters the river, Freddie starts a journey which is more beautiful, funny and mysterious than he could have imagined. And through this journey, Freddie's story becomes interweaved with a cast of unforgettable characters who are equally lost and in search of answers. Eventually, they all unite in their quest for an answer to the biggest question of them all. Will the river take them where they want to go? In the tradition of inspirational works of fiction like The Alchemist and Life of Pi, Secrets of a River Swimmer is at once a profound exploration into living with meaning and an affecting story of people on the cusp of change. Fairly significant. I mean, that significant. There is um, sort of a beautiful inspiration, even just leaving that. The the idea that when you jumped in that river the first time, that it allowed you to reflect and just reprioritize, re-examine, realign with your values. Tell us about the the change for yourself that you've been able to then share through the the character of Freddie. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think through those years of river swimming, I benefited from, so cold water is famous for mm. allowing people to heal mm -hmm. both physically and mentally. And it's quite an experience when you're in really cold water, you get into the water and you just experience pain and then you sort of ease into it and the pain mm -hmm. sort of disappears over time. And then you're left in this sort of very interesting state where you're, you're actually feeling good and you feel remarkably connected to the environment around you. And as you keep going, you find yourself, obviously, if you, you keep going too long, you, <laughs> you drift towards <laughs> hypothermia. Yeah. And, but just before that, just before you become too cold, you're in this state where everything's a bit dreamlike. And it's remarkable. Like you, you, you feel like you are almost being gifted secrets of the universe, mm. it, it, you know, while you're in, you're drifting along in the water. So for me, yeah, it was, it was a wonderful healing experience and provided me with so much joy and euphoria and uplifting time with my friend that like we, we mm -hmm. be, become very close friends through that experience, but it also provided me with clarity on my own existence my own place in the world and the world around me. And, and through that experience, we met some pretty interesting characters who were somewhat shocked 
that we were in the river. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, did they call you a man Australian at us. that point? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, members of the aristocracy and mm -hmm. gillies who basically take people, showing them where to go fishing. And they just gave us all these wonderful stories and insights into the world around the river. So for me, I thought it, it, with the story of Secrets of River Swimmer, I wanted to connect the world around the river with the deeper stuff going on within it. Mm -hmm. So tell me the most profound reflection for yourself. I think, I think my most profound reflection from that experience was to trust myself more mm -hmm. and to trust that I'm connected with the bigger whole and to listen more to the voice of my higher self in you know, my gut instinct mm. and to know that that's coming from a place of wisdom that my brain <laughs> doesn't yeah. have access to. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, not that I've been a, a swimmer, I'm, I'm a runner and so I swim like a, a stone uh, or, a, you know, a, just anyway, I'm a bad swimmer. I can just swim to save myself, but that's about it. But I find that the rhythm of running, I was a, a middle and long distance runner and, you know, did a marathon and that kind of thing and a few halves and it, that, as you say, finding that kind of zone where the conscious mind, it just moves away and that stuff just doesn't matter so much and you just feel that connection to either the pounding of your feet or the you know for you the the cold and the, the environment where you are it is an amazing thing to allow yourself to just let the spiritual just sneak in a little bit rather than have that kind of you know that forebrain chat 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 chatting to you about all the problems of the world exactly yeah it is spiritual yeah. you just you feel connected with the environment around you on a, on a level that doesn't happen when you're sitting there thinking in your head. Mm. It's, yeah, it's an amazing experience. Mm. Let's talk about the corporate sector. Let's talk about <laughs> all of those things because I'm also a, a corporate sector survivor and now run my <laughs> own business and uh, still work in health, but, uh, you know, I don't work uh, in the in the private sector anymore. Except Actually, I do because I'm a small business operator. You know, let's move on. Yeah. Corporate sector. It can be really soulless. And for myself, found that when I'd done all the things, was running hospitals, was doing all the stuff that is where most people seem to aim for in their ambition, it just wasn't doing anything for me. It was like, okay, so, mm. or what's now? You're still doing a good <laughs> job. But the most important parts for me were the people that I was meeting and now moving on as a, as a coach and uh, a consultant and a change agent, I realized that really that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people discover their values, align mm. to their potential and their strengths and those kind of things. So for you, what did you do in this transition of seven years? You're still working, obviously, in the, uh, the corporate sector. How did you marry up this wonderful experience you were having in the river and going back and just churning through the treadmill? Yeah, that's a great question. So I was working in fund management, sustainable fund, man fund management. Mm -hmm. um, and I was working in an office in Edinburgh, mm -hmm. where it was interesting that it was a culture that just totally didn't align with my values. And, you know, as you said, that experience. And I think one of the great benefits of all that river swimming was that I just, I was pretty clear on my values mm -hmm. and it, you know, it was very obvious when I got out of the river that I wasn't your typical fund manager. <laughs> I, was, <Yeah. laughs> I was interested in the environment around me and yeah. I was and connecting with people and being compassionate and helping people and all these things were inside me anyway, but they were just very, very clear through that experience. And yeah, I was then going back to work and the only thing people spoke about was making money. Mm. Had a, a, you know, a boss literally bang the table in the morning sometimes saying, let's make some effing money. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> like a chimpanzee or something. <laughs> it was very, very strange. Mm. And I think that's not uncommon in the capitalist system. Like a lot of, I think it's probably most extreme in finance and investment and other mm -hmm. parts of the corporate world, but it, yeah, it just didn't work for me. 
so then I just, yeah, I realized I had to make a change. So I, I just sort of gradually pieced together a plan of what would happen next, which, mm -hmm. which hasn't actually played out in any way. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're a pantser in life as well as, um, uh, as, as authoring? <laughs> Well, I thought I'd plotted, but I can't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, yeah, very good. I jumped out and I, it's the best thing I ever did. Like yeah. I'm so much happier not being in that one dimensional world. Yeah. Do you think that there were people within that sector or within your organisation at the time who were envious of the courage that it takes to step away from something that is obviously going to make you more money uh, into <laughs> something that perhaps makes you a little more happy? Yeah. The feedback I got consistently was, are you mad? <laughs> okay. Have you thought this through? Yeah. And I, I suspect that's sort of almost a defense that's, that, you know, you're looking at somebody that's saying, let's live life, you know, in a way that's aligned with my values. Let's have more joy and fun. And that might be a bit threatening to some people is, is mm. the way I read it. So yeah, I didn't actually get direct feedback from anyone mm -hmm. in the investment world saying, well, I'm, I'm envious you know you, you you're on the right path here hmm. i just got some sniggers and some jokes and but i think maybe it's just yeah that they, they, they're not prepared yet to make that step so um, i'm hopeful <laughs> i'm yes. hopeful more people so perhaps you've inspired them yeah so yeah. tell us what are you doing then to live to your potential to bring the uh the learning the experience that you've had and the you know the, your understanding and not your drive necessarily, but your reason for, you know, your raison d'etre to be happy and to, to look at peace and kindness and compassion. What are you, what else are you doing besides writing the book? Has it sort of blossomed into more of your life? It has. Yeah. So we, we did, when we returned to Australia, we spent a few years in Brisbane first, mm -hmm. and then we realized that we are country people at heart and country living seem more aligned with all those values, the same values that sort of identified through the, the river swimming. Yeah. And so we now live quite a, quite a sort of country focused life. Like we live in the middle of nowhere in the Sunshine Coast hinterland and it's all about, yeah, protecting wildlife and looking after animals and con contributing to the community. So yeah, it's definitely, our life has played out in quite a different way these days than when I was in the midst of the investment and corporate world. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, it's definitely connected with all those inner shifts, I think, or inner, inner realizations. So yeah, it's, um, and beyond the writing, I'm focused on most of my income at the moment comes from sustainability. Mm -hmm. So I definitely am focused on what I can do to try and make the world a better place. Or, or, even if that is little things, little changes that I can contribute towards. Sounds brilliant. And I'm sure your kids are going to uh, have a much, I won't say healthier lifestyle, but they're going to be much warmer than they were <laughs> in Scotland. Yeah, Although exactly. I have to be careful because my husband's family is from Dundee. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, his, his mum's family were from Malvern, from the Midlands. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty strong collection over there. And Scotland is beautiful. However, I will say that most of his cousins now live in Australia, many of them in Queensland. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a long queue of people trying to come over here, I believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it is a pretty great nation at the moment. And, you know, there, we have many things to go and particularly in terms of voice and treaty and truth telling, a lot of work still to do. But, gee, it's a great place to live. Yeah, from a lifestyle perspective, we are super lucky. Yes. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, I have to ask you, what sort of chickens do you have? We've got a range. We've, mm -hmm. got, um, we've got a bunch of silkies. Yeah, oh, we've I love got silkies. They're so cute. A, some normal ones and we've mm -hmm. got the i can't remember the name right now the they look like they're quite fat but they're mainly uh, feathers uh, like a lot of, <laughs> we've got one called mrs o is her uh, name and oh. a lot of our guests or visitors always say you've been overfeeding that chicken <laughs> <laughs> like, no no promise you they're feathers <laughs> <laughs> all feathers yeah well, our flock is down to just a couple of silkies at the moment uh who are pretty gorgeous but pretty silly um, yeah, so our rooster, we will have to uh, give him a few more ladies because he's a great little rooster. He really looks after them. And he came down uh, the other morning, as I mentioned to you, you know, off air, we've lost one of our Isa Browns, who was his companion. And he came down and I gave him some sunflower seeds and he went, oh, 
and he thought he looked around because usually he would let them eat everything and, and maybe have one or two at the end. But he just oh, he didn't really know what to do with it. So he kind of left them and walked away. I felt so sad for him. Anyway, yeah. What time does he wake you up every day? Yeah, sometimes about four, five. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. We had a rooster and we were like, okay, we're awake. <laughs> we're awake. We're awake now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But I get up at six to do writing, so that's okay. Yeah. Let's have a, a little bit of a think of further. Take me into your philosophy about kindness and compassion and those kind of things. Who do you read or who have you researched in terms of finding, you know, ways to express that in in the way you're living? Have you got favourite, um, you know, books that you are your touchstones? Yeah, I really enjoyed Eckhart Tolle's The Power of Now. Mm. In his book. And mm. that's essentially getting into the, the present moment and then allowing your values yep. to, to exist within you and live and living in, you know, in alignment with your values. So for me, that was one of the more memorable ones I've, you know, books I've read mm -hmm. that, that affected a change in my life. I also think, um, yeah, it's not so much about, yeah, making money in my opinion, but the book Think and Grow Rich mm. has been quite a, an influential novel in my life. Mm -hmm. It's, it's by Napoleon Hill yep. and it's just, it's, it's a bit outdated. So it was written a hundred and something years ago, but it's mm -hmm. all about just uh, being positive and celebrating the little things in your life mm -hmm. and then watching the good stuff grow as you're more, as you're more grateful. So yeah, for me, that was another one worth highlighting, I think. Yeah, definitely. There's some great research and coming from a, a science and sort of medical background, I love seeing the research and right down at the, you know, quantum physics and anatomical scale. Uh, there's some really good uh, scientific evidence around compassion and kindness being really good for our bodies, which is amazing. And, you know, moving on to things like meditation and those kind of things as well. But uh, yeah, Dr. Christian, Christian Neff has done a lot of work around that. I quite like her stuff. I uh, like yes. um, uh, Simon, what's his name? I think his name's Simon. It's, well, oh no, Alain de Botton. Like some of his stuff, it makes philosophy really practical and it, it just brings a gentle reflection into people's lives. That's, that's quite good. Yeah. Lots yeah. Of, lots definitely. of beautiful books to read. Yeah. There are. And one of the most interesting things was that the interpretation of uh, uh, who's the survival of the fittest? Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin, yes. Yeah. In fact, when you go and read <laughs> Charles Darwin's <laughs> the work properly, it's a bit selective, like, you know, the, uh, the dud news that we get these days. But what he was saying was, in fact, that his, what he saw was that the fittest, uh, so the survival is where there is a community who are kind and will care for all of the people uh, and will look after them because the sense of community and, and family, uh, family and relationships, that's what will be the survival, not necessarily the fittest in terms of strength or, you know, righteousness or those kind of things. And it was interesting because he lost a young child, as uh, I did, um, and the grief that he found that he lived with around that made him re-examine his life and think about what was important and those kind of things so yeah it's it's funny what will trigger that sense of you know what this is not for me i'm doing things wrong here i need to make a change yeah oh grief is so powerful isn't it yeah I, i'd never experienced it to the degree I, as about a year ago we lost a golden retriever mm -hmm. and she was my best friend she was with me all the time and i was devastated and it just, everything in my life, I sort of re-questioned it a, a bit after that. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, am I really wanting that? Is that aligned with my values? Mm. But it does, you sort of look at the world in a slightly different way, I think, when you're grieving and, and after that. Yeah, most definitely. Okay, let's have a look at the process of your writing. Uh, so, you know, we've sort of dived into the what the book is all about. So tell me, are you a plotter or a pantser or in fact, a you know, kind of a ideas person rather than a spreadsheet person? Yeah, I, <laughs> by nature, I'm a pantser. Yes. As my family will testify. So, <laughs> but I, I, but so I've basically got a three book deal with a publisher in New York called The Story Plant. Mm -hmm. and secrets of river swimmer is the first book mm -hmm. and what i've discovered working with my publisher is 
they want a plan before mm. I commit to writing a book. Yeah. So they How hard is that? that? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For a pantser, it's like, <laughs> why would I do that? Yeah. But it's been quite interesting going down the process, well, going through the process of putting together plans for my books and then presenting the plan for feedback. And it's been, I've actually enjoyed it because it's challenged me to think more about the story arc and yeah. particularly how to start a book to make it sort of, um, to generate the momentum you need through the course of the story. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, when I get to about, when I sit down to write the book and I get to about 20 pages in, my plan goes out the window. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have to then apologize to my publisher and say, yeah, it's not quite what we agreed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But here it is. <laughs> yeah, here it is. Exactly. <laughs> oh, very good. So you are well, um, into the, uh, well, writing, editing, publishing, uh, process for your second book. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So my second book is called the connection game and it's, it's still literary fiction. It's, it's, borderline a psychological thriller it's quite a suspenseful story based in london i lived mm -hmm. in london for many years mm -hmm. about a family called the basilworths mm -hmm. and benny basilworth is the father and husband in the family and he's a genius so he is he can solve any puzzle win any game show he's got one of those sort of ridiculously high iqs mm. and despite that so he, he wins this national game show called the connection game mm -hmm. they win a huge amount of money and everything's going incredibly well for the basilworths but then everything goes wrong <laughs> and yeah. they that find themselves a victim of an online fraud and all their assets are stolen that's pretty and, topical given the optus <laughs> breach at the moment <laughs> yes yes exactly ah. So they, and they have to move to welfare housing and the only welfare uh, property available is a little flat below the street level with a, with a minuscule window with a view of the passing oh, right, feet yeah. on the street above. Mm -hmm. And Benny Basilworth in his despair starts staring out the window at the passing feet and then starts to see patterns in the feet outside the window. And he starts to piece together puzzles about what's happening out there and then he gets very scared he thinks something big is happening outside their window so that's that's the premise and wow. then the proceeds from there to to yeah. i guess it's a journey you know what's he seen is it real yeah. you know what's going on outside the window mm, fascinating because you can imagine those little windows having not lived in one myself but you've seen them enough in movies that it's like Yes, you wonder what the world is doing. Great sense of people watching, but he's only foot watching. He can only see the feet. Wow. So that's yeah. <laughs> Where did that come from? But... What were you thinking, Simon, when, when that popped into your head? Yeah, did... I, I was, so we lived in London for 10 years. Yeah. And at one point was trying to save rent, I believe, and accepted a flat below street level uh -huh. very similar sort of place yes so you you've been there <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's something quite interesting about watching the feet I, I remember i had a flatmate and we were what, looking out onto the street and go wow look at that it's kind of it's a little bit therapeutic it's, it's mm. hard to describe it mm -hmm. and then you stop seeing the feet as people after after a while like, <laughs> it's a foot going past the window <laughs> So yeah, it was based on that, and then it's grown into something quite, quite different from my yeah. experience. Yeah. Very good. And the character of Benny Baselworth, any part of yourself in there? Writers often find little bits of themselves, or they're exploring a particular aspect. They do, don't they? Yeah. For me, I think I can relate most to Benny's wife, Belinda. Mm -hmm. Bell is a shortened, shortened name. So I really wanted. So the novel is written from her perspective and I can relate to her perspective more than Benny's, mm -hmm. but Benny seems to me to represent a, a particular breed of male who's mm. very, very, who's got a very, very high IQ, but EQ is right at the Not bottom. Not so much. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and uh -huh. I've worked with a lot of guys like that. Yeah. And it just felt like an opportunity to create quite a unique character out of that, that sort of personality type 
when you are writing your characters, do you uh, you know write character profiles for them, or do they more or less kind of morph into your head, fully formed, or unpack themselves across the page? Yeah. So for Secrets of a River Swimmer, I I just I knew how it was going to start, and then the characters sort of introduced themselves to me as we went along. So Willard, one of the main characters just emerged mm -hmm. and suddenly he was well formed inside of me. Yeah. It's like, I don't know where he came from, but <laughs> <laughs> he just appeared on the page. But then yeah. because I had to write the, uh, the, the plan for my publisher for the connection game, I had to write character essays for each of the char uh, characters and that was different, but mm. yeah, it was the same thing. Once I started writing, the characters just sort of emerged in a slightly different way to, to what I thought. It's interesting. Sometimes it's, you don't really know where the characters are coming from. They're just no. sort of <laughs> residing inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a little weird. It's, it's a little parasitic. I think sometimes you go, where the hell did that come from? But yes, <laughs> there they are, you know, tapping on the shoulder saying, no, I'm about to kill off one of your favorite side characters. So too bad. You think, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. There it How did you get inside me? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, very good. So what's the goal for the connection game? What's happening with that? Tell us where it's at. So feedback from my publisher and the editors involved mm -hmm. was that it's, it's got quite a good commercial appeal because mm -hmm. it's a bit Hitchcockian, suspenseful mm -hmm. and surprising. So a lot of people don't guess where it goes at the end. Ah, very good. So really I'm now, I'm now quite focused on just investing in my writing career and getting everything aligned for that launch. Mm -hmm. And I guess talking about it more, I think that w when you're a first time author, you get a book out there and that's a victory in itself. Like yes. you just want to celebrate. <laughs> yes. It's a mountain, isn't it? It's an Everest. <laughs> exactly. But then. There's so much more to it to create a career out of writing. I've, oh, I've discovered there's so many yeah. business angles and yes. marketing angles, and profile raising. And so I'm now more aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm now going to, yeah, just do what I need to do to get everything aligned for mm -hmm. February 22nd and then the rest of next year to make sure Connection Game realizes its potential. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. <laughs> You're all in. You're <laughs> ready to go. Goes well, then, <laughs> So do you think... Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and if it goes well... Uh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, if it goes well, then I can I can write more. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> and if you write more, because I noticed that you're a, a blog writer as well, what does writing more look like if you, uh, you know, ease down on the sustainability work and ease up on the writing? Is it more novels? Is it freelance writing? Is it what? Yeah, I think... Novels are quite different from blogs and short stories. It's you've got to create an entire world mm. in a novel. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Like, there's something glorious about getting to the end and then obviously editing it and everything, but looking back and realizing you have created a world in that novel. Yeah. So I'd love to maybe write a novel a year and a bunch of short stories and, and obviously some blog, blog posts as well. Mm -hmm. But a, a, about a book a year is is what I'd sort of love to do longer mm. term. And what sort of genres will you, or do you see as, as your future? I mean, you've got the three book deal sometimes, which is a bit constricted as to, restricted rather as to what you can write. But if you didn't necessarily have that um, commitment, what would you be writing? It's a good question. I hear so I'm in the literary fiction genre for all my three books mm -hmm. and literary fiction, I think is the home of the most unique books because there's sort of, there's no formula for literary fiction. They tend to be books that, you know, are, are totally artistic and creative. Whereas, you know, a genre like uh, murder mystery is similar in the sense that there's usually a death early in the novel and then the novel goes through the journey of trying to figure out who did it. So I feel, I do feel like I'm in my right genre mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, with the connection game. I had this debate with my publisher. Is this a psychological thriller? Because it felt like it might be to me. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's not formulaic enough. Like it's mm. too 
unique. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, yep. And, the, the tropes are not quite in the right orders, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. He said that's the, that's the key selling point yeah. for the novel. But it's, he said it's more like a Hitchcock film than it is mm. a typical psychological thriller. So I think literary fiction is my home. I think I'll stay in there. You feel it's sort of quite a, yeah. a broad home to, to live in. I can do a lot of stuff in there. Excellent. Now tell me about the most useful writing advice you've been given. I can hear That's, that your yeah. editor has been very helpful, but what other useful pieces of advice? So there's so much advice out there and I've learned to take everything a little, little bit of a, a, with a grain of salt and yeah. to <laughs> test it out for yourself. Mm-hmm. Is this for me or is this just, you know, not necessarily matching up? And Stephen King has got so much advice in his book on writing and through his interviews. And there's one bit of his advice that I find is a game changer. And that's to, uh, he presents it as a formula. Uh, He says the final draft equals the first draft minus 10% of the words. And he said, Mm -hmm. if you can execute that, and basically what he's saying is defluff your writing, get rid of any word that is not needed make it economic, concise, to the point, then you're actually carving out the great writing from the average or good writing. And it's it's a hard process to go through when you're editing and you're trying to get rid of that many words. Yes, but it it's, is. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, it's a game changer because yeah. it's allowing me, I believe, to get to the, the next level. Yeah. So I, would, I would massively recommend that bit of advice and yeah, I, I think it's, it's a great way to edit your work. Yeah. Have you had the assistance of an editor through your publisher? So they, my publisher helps with the final copy editing stage, mm-hmm. but in, in, for each of my books, I've actually got a, gone and found a de- developmental editor of my own, of my own back. Mm-hmm. And I, oh my God, working with an editor, de- particularly amazing. at the developmental stage is mm-hmm. a game changer. Mm. Like, I studied English at uni. I've done many writing courses, Mm -hmm. but I reckon working with an editor at that early stage and getting detailed feedback is worth everything I did 10 times over. It's just (laughs) an amazing opportunity to just really learn about writing and your own writing. So yeah, I'd I'd recommend having both levels like a developmental and then copy editing as well. Yeah, very good makes me think about uh, coming into writing or into a new career later, you know, in similar, you know, you and I have both done that. Um, yes. Tell me how hard is it, how hard did you find it to go back to being a novice when you were previously good at what you did? Yes. You got to kind of the master stage and then you go, oh, now I've got to begin and now I've got to learn about <laughs> marketing and now I've got to learn about editing and oh, where do I begin? It can be overwhelming for new writers or for people newly into writing. Exactly. You sort of go right back to the bottom of the heap again. Yes. Yes. I, I actually, I found it daunting at stages, but I'm, I love it now mm-hmm. because I've got sort of in the rhythm of having a beginner's mindset about things and everything seems more exciting, but you I feel like you're all always open to learning mm-hmm. and your growth trajectory goes off the charts when yeah. you when you go through that process oh yeah <laughs> so, so it's been awesome and i would do it again to make the changes i've made but you do definitely have to be humble and you have to accept that you don't know as much as others and that there's a vast world out there of things to learn about in, in, you know when you're publishing books i think the ha- the hardest thing for me is social media mm-hmm. i still don't get it and <laughs> i feel like an, a dinosaur compared to most people <laughs> Have yeah. your children explained it to you? Well, yeah, my daughter's seven, so she's uh, not quite there not yet. Not quite there yet. That's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'd keep her more interested in the chickens and uh, getting onto TikTok and, you know, explaining all those things. Thank God. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there you go. So your advice then for an aspiring author, if some, because we have to say that you're pretty established now. You've got a three book deal. You've got your first one out. The second one's close to publishing. What advice would you give an aspiring author? Yeah, I think looking back at how I've got to where I am, I think figuring out why you're writing is mm. is a very empowering move because most of us aren't writing for money. And if you are writing for money, you're probably going to be disappointed, at least for the first decade. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I think figuring out why you're writing gives you the opportunity to tap into those questions that are deep yeah. inside your soul. And they are often a wonderful inspiration for the best writing in the world. You, you, you tend to, when you re, tend to read a great novel, it tends to come from a novelist who's had a really important question to solve through writing the book. So I think figuring out why you're writing and being really personal about it allows you to access the stories that are deep in your soul that can become great stories in the future when you're writing. So I'd recommend that, focusing on yourself and where your journey is beginning. Mm, fantastic. And then they may also find that they get some great responses to their writing. I was reading some of the reviews of your writing and absolutely brilliant. What is the best response you've ever had? Yeah, thank you. The best response, so I didn't realize that when you're, particularly when you're a first time author, mm -hmm. the it's, it's on you to find somebody to blurb the cover of your book. Mm -hmm. So my publisher said, who's going to blurb your book? And I didn't realize that was, <laughs> that was the case. I was, I was like, where's the amazing author who's blurbing my book? So then I sent an email to Heather Morris, who's, she now lives in Brisbane, but she's a New Zealander by, by background. Mm -hmm. And she's the amazing author of the tattooist of Auschwitz and all those follow on books about that stage in history. Mm. And I believe Heather's sold double digit millions of copies of books. Like she's so successful. So I sent her an email and inquired as to whether she would read my book and, and you know, consider blurbing the front cover. Mm -hmm. And she eventually said she'd read it, but couldn't obviously promise anything. Yeah. And a couple of months later, I got an email from her that reduced me to tears. So she, ah. she said it was one of the best books she'd read in recent years and it had been something she needed to read on a personal level for a bunch of reasons and had changed everything on, on a few levels in her life. And she said, I just can't recommend it highly enough. She said, I, ah. I, I, I love the book. So for Can someone like that, better than that, yeah. And for, for someone like that to say that, yeah, I'll never forget it. <laughs> oh, that, that is pretty special. That is absolutely special. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Very good. He's hoping then that the connection game strikes up some, you know, equally wonderful reviews. Fingers crossed. You yeah. never know what's coming. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely. Okay. So tell us what your writing process is, you know, you, you, between work and all those kind of things. Are you a right in the gaps kind of person? Are you an early morning writer or an evening writer? Or do you have days that you write? Yeah, it's, that's such a good question. I, I know Stephen King advises everyone to write every single day and mm. uh, just get in that discipline. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I can see where he's coming from because the key to writing is writing more. Mm. But I have learned to be a bit kind on myself and flexible through that process. So I, I'm usually at my best in the morning mm -hmm. and getting up early and just allowing the writing to sort of jump onto the page, <laughs> hopefully. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, some days you're in the flow and it's easy and some days you're not. So the days I'm in, my, in the flow, I tend to try to create more time for the writing and just let the words do the work. But the days that it doesn't work, I, I, I've started accepting it more Mm -hmm. and going, okay, I don't know why, but yep. today's not a writing not day. Today. Yeah. <laughs> and that's been a game changer as well. That's been, it, it's allowed me to be more joyful about the writing. And I think that's a key part of it. So, yeah. Definitely. A lesser chore and more joy for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Simon, you mentioned uh, before we began that you're going to be talking to some librarians. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so there's a big conference in, I believe it's mid-October every year, mm -hmm. where all the uh, librarians in the US come together to talk about uh, books they will believe could be bestsellers mm -hmm. in the coming year. Mm -hmm. And so I'm on the panel to talk to, I believe there's 10 to 20,000 librarians in the US. Wow. So it's going to be quite an experience. I've got to get yeah. up at I think it's going to be 2 a.m. Uh, yeah. Australian time. Of course. <laughs> they didn't think about me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get up and through a video link, be on this panel with three other authors, talk about our books. 
but mm-hmm. yeah, I'm super excited. Like it's it's wonderful that they're embracing the connection game like that. So yeah. it should be very, very interesting and fun. Excellent. So if you had to then, I'm going to put you on the spot here and say for both your books, tell me what is the main message or the key message or the message you want people to take away from Secrets of a River Swimmer first? Secrets of a River Swimmer, yeah. So the main message in my opinion, everyone might, might get different messages, but always, is that, yes, no guarantees. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is to trust more in yourself and get uh-huh. to know yourself through that journey of trusting yourself and to know that the universe or the river or whatever you want to call it has got your back through that process and that the whole journey becomes more meaningful, fulfilling, enriching when you share it with people you love. Yeah, that is a good message. Now tell us a little bit about the connection game. So the connection game is is a more interesting one from the perspective of I can't share too much because the ending. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, don't surprise no spoilers, people. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a very different story. Um, I think if there was to be a message I, I I could highlight from the connection game, it's that. We all have a choice between a good path and a bad path, a a better version of ourselves Mm. and a worse version of ourselves. And just being conscious of where you are in that decision making process, you know, overall in your life and on a day to day basis is quite empowering and quite important to make sure that you're staying on the right path. Mm. Almost like trust yourself again, isn't it? It's similar, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but that's but there's a yeah the subtle difference in the way the message is obviously going to be delivered, which you're not yeah. telling us the end of. So that's no. okay. We will look forward to it coming <laughs> onto the website, uh, and really as soon as you've got a pre-order URL, you can um, yeah send us the details. That'd be fantastic. Well, Brilliant. yeah. So ten to twenty thousand librarians. Wow, that's that that is a great audience. Exactly. So I've got to make sure I speak, uh, I say the right thing. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully this has helped that you've, you know, been able to uh, just, yeah, sort through a few things. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Great to talk to you. Very good. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now. I think Ah, you're a great guest and you are a great interviewer. Ah, thank you. Much, much appreciated. Yeah, we just love listening to people talk about their creativity and their work. And we're not bound by time. That's the other thing where sometimes perhaps the uh, more commercial, some of the more commercial podcasts I know, writers have said they felt a bit hurried. Said, yeah, we're not in a hurry. Yeah, (laughs) it's important, I think. Yeah, Yeah, it is. So tell me, what are your final words for potential readers or writers? Yeah, I think... The, the modern world is going through unique challenges and most of the challenges are associated with disconnection. Mm. So we, we've never been as disconnected as a species before. And I think both reading and writing are game changers from that mm. perspective. So when you're writing, you are connecting with yourself and you're feeding your soul. And through that process, you are connecting with the world. It's just such an amazing thing to do. Yeah. So more of us can benefit from that by writing more. And equally, when you're reading, you're opening yourself up to being a part of new worlds and new ways of thinking, and you're developing empathy for other people around you. And I think that's an amazing way to connect with people Mm. and, yeah, to make your life better through that process. So I think we should all be reading and writing more. They're amazing things to do. You have absolutely no argument from me there. Yeah, Yeah, I won't admit to how many books I have read this year, but I read a lot and it's just, yeah, it it is so important for my creative soul, really, that I do that. It just, yeah, that works for me. Yeah. Tell me where can people find you on the fabulous social media or on the web? Yeah, so my website is ssturnerblog.com. Dot com mm-hmm. and all my social media details are on there i think it's um twitter's ss turner 7 mm-hmm. but everything's on there yeah beautiful all right so jump onto ss blog.com and find all the links to where simon has his books and his blogs and uh look out for the connection game which sounds absolutely amazing 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. And certainly the, look, Secrets of a River Swimmer, we need those books that let people or lead people into finding their, their better self. I really like that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. All right. Simon, it has been fabulous chatting to you and I'm glad we had the video turned off so I couldn't see the sunshine up in the Gubby Gubby <laughs> country because down here in Wurrung we are still drizzly, but such is life. It has been uh, an interesting ride into your background and, yeah, Scotland. It just makes me think of those beautiful, wild Scottish hills. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you, Veronica. It's been a pleasure. All right. Take care and bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Mr. S.S. Turner, thank you so much for being a part of the Australian Book Lovers podcast. And what a fun conversation you had there, Veronica. And, hmm, inspiration and freezing waters. I don't <laughs> think that's out of the, uh, well, it's not out of the stratosphere because I, I, I know the old Wim Hof, the Iceman, is, uh, has been talking for some time now about the benefits of, you know, breathing and then the, the cold water and, and how good it can be for your soul. So... What about yourself? Have you ever found a calling to be jumping into icy waters? Well, as not a swimmer, I'm definitely not a swimmer. I'm a, a runner and a walker. I, I swim like a, an egg beater, so that's it's not a good thing. Uh, I swim like I'm drowning, really. Uh, so I would say no, but I definitely agree with the cold. I remember reading some articles a long time ago when I was doing some training around leadership and and facilitation, those kind of things, is that it's important for people not to get too warm because then they go to sleep. So NASA has done some studies about keeping things, places just a little bit cool, and that keeps people fresh and alert. So going with the extra fresh and alert in a Scottish winter uh, in the river, (laughs) I'm sure that he was very alert and that the reflections that um, his character found not unexpected so that's a good thing yeah no i agree and i think you know definitely know you're alive if you're in a freezing cold position um but it's true i mean adelaide at least you know here here in south australia the the winters can be a little bit chilly i suppose like Mm -hmm. any southern state but what i i'm not a big uh i'm not a big heating person like we don't Mm -hmm. turn the heater on a lot uh, mm-hmm. It's just the way, it's just the way we are. So if I go to places like, for example, in the city or restaurants or wherever during winter, it really yeah. throws me for a six when I walk into somewhere where they've got the heater blaring. Yeah. It's, it's like getting hit with a tranquilizer dart. <laughs> so I've got to be really careful to not, not off. And then, of course, as soon as you're back in the frosty evening outside, the cold air, it's like, oh, now I'm awake again. Uh, bracing. This is the thing, refreshing. All of those words go with cold, don't they? Absolutely. And yeah. You know, the, the that idea of just being so alive and then using that that sort of heightened reality for a moment to contemplate the meaning of life, I guess. Um, mm. What, be, what mm. better way? Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it can be, you know, and I think it's important, you know, I think if anything, cold water and reflection is, is really just stepping out of your comfort zone, isn't it? Like yes. literally, figuratively, yeah. metaphorically, symbolically, put all the ollies on the end and, and that's what <laughs> standing in the icy water is. Yeah. And it's interesting where people get their epiphanies and then what they do with them. So even, you know, and I love that the some of the reviews and people have really enjoyed what the character Freddie has done and they've been able to relate and it's actually brought, you know, different meanings and, and got them to reflect. So it's interesting how people find themselves, you know, through all these sorts of adventures or the events or the, the journeys of, characters in a book uh, so you know even if it's fiction there are messages out there uh, so yeah interesting yeah and i think you know um the the idea of adventure um you know we, we had a chat about this at the lounge which we'll, we'll be heading into shortly but the you know adventure is definitely good for the soul but you know it doesn't mean you have to physically go somewhere not all no. of you have the luxury of doing that at any given point in time but that's what i think is so beautiful and so profound and so awesome about books because they are the best passport and you can have an adventure sitting on a train like i am at the moment going <laughs> to, to and from the city uh yeah. but you know sitting on a beach sitting in the bedroom laying in bed whatever it might be yeah. a book can really take you somewhere but it can also bring with it profound insights into reality that maybe you you come to realizations or you discover you grow you learn 
um, mm. that, that you wouldn't have discovered had you not opened the pages in that book. And I think, you know, how lucky is that? How amazing is that? Good writers, whether it's memoir or mystery, are going to put you into a different headspace. So, yeah, mm. read more mm. Aussie books, I think is what I'm trying to say, Darren. Yes, and uh, well, here's an opportunity for you, being that spring is still a little bit chilly. Maybe you're on the south coast of New South Wales. Um, maybe it's a t an opportunity to jump in those icy waters and just uh, see what sort so, of profound insights you might get. I gain. don't think so. What I have been doing is jumping into every secondhand bookshop we pass, ah, uh, nice. which is a, a good thing. So I think I started out with about seven books. I think I've now got about 20, something ah. like that. So. But I have been able to, I'm using a little app called Library App so that I know which books I'm missing out of series or that I've lent to people that I need to replace. So I've been able to pick up some of those. So that's been fantastic. So have come across a couple of excellent, excellent secondhand bookshops. If you are traveling people up and down the east coast uh, of Australia, don't forget to look out for the secondhand bookshops. Jump in and get yourself some more good books. Absolutely. And in the spirit of Halloween that's coming and all, all the spooky October, mm -hmm. uh, I, I did purchase uh, a bit of a bulk lot of Brian Lumley Necroscope series, which is, you know, obviously a horror, horror books uh, from the late 80s, early 90s. And it came, so it was book one, book three, book four, book five, and then uh, another sort of a accompanying standalone novel that from the same sort of story. And of course, they were really hard to find. So I'm like, oh, damn it, I'd love to have part two. And yeah. now I'm in the city. There's a really good secondhand bookshop in Adelaide, uh, yeah. Adelaide Book Exchange, which has been been around since I was a kid. It's moved slightly in the city, but still, it's massive. It's amazing. Lots of rare antique books as well. So I thought, oh, I'll quickly bolt down while I was having lunch and have a quick look in, just just mm -hmm. to kill a bit of time and stretch my legs. And thought, oh, I'll check out the horror section. And what was sitting there waiting for me? Book uh. two. There you go. So treasure is always waiting for you in a secondhand <laughs> bookshop. And uh, I don't know how they find me or how it knows exactly what I was looking for. But uh, so I agree with you 100%. If you're traveling or going anywhere that you're not normally, uh, you know, somewhere new, keep your eye out for secondhand books. You never Indeed. know what treasure uh, you're going to find. I will admit that I also bought a couple of new ones. Leigh Bardugo's, a uh, couple of new books by her. I did pick up at a very brand new shop. And I must also say, just remind people that you can borrow your books in the library. You don't have to buy them. And I got a notice, unfortunately, just after I'd left, that Green Halen, which is written by one of our Australian book lovers, uh, authors, uh, L.A. Webster, uh, I had asked the local Goldfields Library to get it, and they just said, yeah, it's in. So when I get oh, back, wow. I'm going to check that out because, of course, if you borrow books from the library and you are registered for public lending rights, every time someone borrows your book, the author gets paid. So please, people, uh, writers, make sure you register and readers read more Aussie books. How about we jump into the writer's lounge and catch up with a wonderful guest and enjoy a, a sip or two of a beverage and uh, wind down before we finish up the episode. Excellent. One of my favourite people. Let's go. All right. Our book lovers in the writer's lounge on a kind of wintry spring i think it's a bit hideous darren will have to find out where you think the writer's lounge is today but it's where we meet up with fabulous writers or talk about all things writerly and i'm delighted to say that we have with us tonight naomi shippen now that name might sound a little bit familiar because of course naomi is one of our most helpful book reviewers but more than that uh, Naomi is in fact, of course, you know, a, a writer herself and she's a blogger, she's a reviewer, she's, you know, done lots and lots of things in the writing and publishing space. So we thought we'd get her on for a little bit of a personal chat. So good evening, Naomi. Good evening, Veronica. Thank you for having me on the show. It's delightful to have you live, kind of. <laughs> 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 well, welcome to the uh, Writer's Lounge, Naomi. Welcome to the Writer's oh, Lounge. Yeah. So, Naomi, if you were in a lounge having yes. uh, a conversation with a couple of writers, what kind yes. of drink would you be having? Oh, gosh, I think a nice fancy drink in a champagne glass. You know, one Ooh, of lovely. champagne glasses with maybe a little strawberry floating around on the top. Nice. An umbrella, perhaps, yeah. even? Yeah, why not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, that is very good. I, and I, in that vein, I'm going to go a mojito would be nice to have. And I'm Ooh. going to imagine that it's a lot warmer than it is. Uh, mm-hmm. But, yeah, there you go. What about you, Darren? What would you be drinking in the White Riders Lounge? This Ooh, based on the weather I'm seeing and based on the weather I'm assuming you've got, oh, I think maybe a very, very strong Bloody Mary. With oh, some <laughs> extra Tabasco. Uh, yeah. But uh, you made me think, Naomi, because going back, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years or so, um, I'm sure someone might be able to correct me, but uh, there was a cafe slash bar or restaurant, a lounge bar here in Adelaide that at one point, I think had Australia's most expensive champagne, glass champagne. It was like, I think you could pay between one and $3,000 for a glass. Oh, yeah, but it came with a diamond ring at the bottom. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so definitely one way to impress. Absolutely. But no, so I won't be drinking one of those. I'll have a no, very no. Uh, strong Bloody Mary. No. That would warm the coffers of your heart, wouldn't it? Well, yes. And, and also, I think because of this weather, and I know you're on holidays at the moment, Veronica, so for you, you're from somewhere, you know, broadcasting from a different location. It makes me think of uh, maybe, in my head, I'm picturing you somewhere high and like a, like a villain's lair overlooking... <laughs> From the mountains looking through the window and it's quietly sipping and planning strategies yeah, yeah. yeah maybe yeah, yeah. yeah okay <laughs> All right. we still have a little bit of jazz playing of course <laughs> we do so naomi which uh who are the traditional owners of where you are coming from tonight um i'm on Wur- Wurundjeri land beautiful down in the lovely nam down there in melbourne yes that's right yeah excellent all right so naomi tell us a little bit about you and your writing journey. So, where did writing start for you? Well, um, I, well, I've always wanted to do it, stories and you know making up stories, and um, mm-hmm. I've always wanted to write, but never really kn- known uh, where to start. So, I really didn't get started until recent years, um, a bit later in life, um, because I I just didn't even know where to start and. Um, I suppose I don't have any regrets, but it would, I do admire, you know, younger people. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some great, really young writers who just sit down and do it, or people with families who just sit down and do it. Um, I think I just waited for the, was waiting for the perfect time when I'd have uh, lots of time and space to myself, and of course that time never comes. So <laughs> I realised finally you just got to sit down and, and do it between the cracks, as they say. Yes. And so what was the, the first kind of forays into writing that you tried? Oh, I've always kind of dabbled. I did start a, a course, it would have been about 2010 when my children were in primary school. Mm-hmm. And um, we didn't have all the online stuff then, or if it, we did have, I didn't know about it, but it was um, a correspondence course. So I would, you know, snail mail, you know, stories back and forth. And it was actually a novel writing course. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did pretty well at it. I was quite happy with the story I came up with, but then two things happened. One, I came up with a, came to a snag in the story that, you know, required a little bit of um, effort and, and research. And two, yeah. um, I, I'd gone from working part-time to going back to full, full-time with young kids and I, st- I just thought, this is too hard. I'm going to put this away until, you know, such time as I've got more time to myself. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, that time can come for another 10 years or so. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I do admire people who push through, you know, I know people who've got huge commi- commitments and they push through, but, you know, I waited. Um, and so it wasn't until recent years, I think 2018, I f- sat down to write my first novel. Yep. Um, and that was inspired by a trip to Japan um, that we went on. And I think just the fact that I was in a different env- environment mm-hmm. and had time to think and didn't have the usual obligations of life. Um, and, and I just started writing it on hotel stationery and my iPhone and whatever bits of paper I could get my hands on. And then mm-hmm. when I got back home to Melbourne, that's when I sat down and really started writing what was my first novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I worked on that and I thought I was finished like <laughs> after two months I, I had um, what I now know was just a first draft and I thought what what's going on I thought this is meant to take years and years <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, then I realized well it wasn't finished I had only just begun um, so then I started editing that and that took another few years um, but you know, in between times, I, I feel like I'd finished and I was done. And then I started on a second project, mm-hmm. 
that would have been about 2019. So I had kind of two projects running concurrently. Um, but the first project I've ended up sort of shelving. Um, I did complete it. It went through a lot of editing with critique partners, beta readers, did courses, all of that. I did some, um, had some professional assessments done. Um, but in the end, I decided, um, no, I didn't want to go with that one. I preferred to, that to be my practice novel because I think mm -hmm. you, do need, you need, do need a lot of practice. And so the second novel that I've written, which I completed at the beginning of this year, is the one that's been recently accepted by Kingsley Publishers. Fantastic. Patience. Yeah, so it was sort of like I have been querying, well, since the beginning of the year I've been querying and I've had my you know fair share of rejections, um, including one uh, was a, my dream agent. <laughs> mm. um, and my dream agent had my manuscript for about six months and I could tell as the months were going on, I just thought, nah, she's not interested. She's not getting back to me. And sure enough, um, she confirmed that no, she didn't want to go with it. She just she said, oh, you're a wonderful writer, but this isn't for me. So um, I kept on querying and um, I got a yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Tenacity yeah. wins. It does. I think you've just got to keep trying and it will it will hit you out of the blue. I think you can get a bit comfortable with rejection and you can kind of settle into that and you, you, while you make every effort to um, put your best foot forward in query, you still have it in the back of your head, oh, this is not going to work, it's not going to happen. And then one day, you know, when it finally does, it, it's kind of a shock to the system. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so you don't, don't quite know what, what to do with that. So. Uh, yeah, so I was very pleased to get that uh, acceptance recently. Well, yeah, good, that's... Uh, yeah, good shock to the system. And I think, you know, one thing we could probably agree is, uh, look, everyone has their own timetable, but, uh, yeah. you know, when you start writing or when you finish the novel or when you start writing the novel, whatever it might be, but all roads eventually lead to the writer's lounge. And now here you are. Yes. <laughs> here I am. <laughs> well, so now you know you've really made it, Naomi, because <laughs> you're, you're on the Australian Book Lovers Writer's Lounge. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, Maybe it's like so, that Hotel California where no one realises yeah. how they uh, got there, and <laughs> but they're there now. And now you can never leave. You're, you're author forever. Oh, um, well, as long as you keep me in champagne, I'm happy. <laughs> Well, yeah, champagne cocktails, I can't see anything wrong with that at all. Um, tell me a little bit about why Japan, or do you think there was something particular about you being either on holidays or was it on holidays in Japan that switched on that creative, yep, just got to put this down? I think because it's such a different place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's just such a different place, different culture. And I think just the fact that I was away out of my environment, I mean, I could have probably been in, you know, Tasmania or Germany or, or anywhere, really. I think having yeah. that break from routine, I think we've got to get away from our desk sometimes, leave the house and just get a, a, a change of scene. Mm, um, mm. It's like, um, I don't know if you've read that book, um, The Artist's Way. Yes, Julia Cameron's book, love it. Yes. Julia Cameron, like she says, you know, take yourself on a date, get out of the house, go see something different because you need to fill up your creative well because you, you can't write in a vacuum. You've got to have something to write about. So I think just the fact of, um, you know, just getting that change of scene was the stimulus that I needed. So I think all writers um, should be given a grant to go on an overseas holiday. <laughs> you know, oh, yes, you know, uh, I second that motion. House, take note. <laughs> yeah. Ah, oh, that is fantastic. So, Naomi, not only have you gone out and learned things, you've, you know, uh, been to courses, you've listened to uh, bits and pieces from all over the place, you've used beta readers and professional feedback, you're part of the writing community, a really important part of contributing the to and fro of uh, not only your work, but other people's work. So, as well as that, you're a blogger, and as well as that, you're a book reviewer. Mm -hmm. So, so many things go into making up your, I guess, your your experience as a writer yes. or contribute to it. What do you think would be the first thing that you would suggest? You know, you mentioned that uh, you didn't know where to start. If somebody yeah. was listening and was thinking, look, I think I'd love to, I feel a bit like now, I've always wanted to write, right? Yes. What should be their first step? 
I think just sit down and write something, even if it's just you know some. I, I, in the um, that the book again um, about the artist's way, they talk about morning pages, where you sit down first thing in the morning and you just write whatever you want, and it's not for anybody else to see. You don't even read it again. Um, yeah. You just just the act of writing can clear the mental trash, so to speak. I would say start with that. It doesn't even have to be in the morning, just whenever you want. Just write, get out a, a notebook and, and just write in it. The other thing I would suggest is do a course, do any mm -hmm. course, start mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, I started with um, the Australian Writers' Centre course, um, So You Want to Be a Writer. And in that course, they discuss all the different types of writing, like novel writing or writing articles or content writing or copywriting. And in doing that course, that's the first course I did with them, and I've done several, um, it just really clarified the kind of writing that I wanted to do, which was writing novels. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would recommend that course. If you, if you, if you just got that itch that you want to write, but you don't know what you want to write or or where to start, I would say start with that course because it will clarify for you what where you want to at least uh, start and where you want to go from there. But yeah, first piece of advice, I'd say just get an exercise book and just write the first thing that comes into your head every day. Good advice. Mm. And travel to Japan. Because <laughs> it's, it's super fun over there. You and, didn't and, say that because you've got relatives over there. Well, but also walking the streets of Tokyo at night is definitely uh, <laughs> fuel for the imagination. Yeah, it certainly is. And what are you working on now, Naomi? Yeah. I'm actually, I'm glad you asked me because I've been thinking today and yesterday I must get back onto my next project. I've got a, another novel that I did start earlier this year. Um, and I've done the outline. Um, I, I'm, I'm really a, a plotter now. Um, and because I write suspense, you know, plot's so important. Um, so I've plotted it all out. I've written the rough out outline, but I haven't looked at it for months. And to be honest, I'm not sure why I haven't looked at it for, for months. I've got, um, I suppose, there were books that were, were coming out. There were a lot of really fantastic books that came out this year. So I wanted to read and review them. Um, so I've done that and there were a couple of um, articles that I wanted to write um, for publications. I had um, an article published in a, um, in a literary journal recently uh, this year. So there were other smaller projects I wanted to do and I think, think they've taken me away from that project but I think now I want to want to concentrate on that. So it's um, it's hard to keep up with, you know, what they call all the other things um, that you need to do um, yeah. as well, because, you know, it's all well and good to sit there and write your novel, but you need to engage with the, the writing community. You need to, um, you know, have some sort of a presence outside of novels as well, I think, so people can get a little taste of your work before you commit to a novel. But then on the other hand, there are people who, who um, who goes straight into a novel. I heard an interview with Danuka McKenzie who wrote uh, oh, yes. recently, um, yeah. The Torrent, which is fantastic. And she said, it's, it's the first thing she wrote. Oh, <laughs> she had the right voice. It was just perfect. Yes, yes. So so I guess, the, you know, there's no um, rule book, is there? Yeah. When it comes to writing, no, you've reason. got to sort of find mm. your own way, I guess. Yeah. Mm. So yes. <laughs> when you're reviewing a book, Naomi, uh, yes. what is it you love about a book that makes you go, ah, oh, this is brilliant, I want to keep reading, turning the pages? I think that feeling of just being sucked into that the world that the writer creates. Mm -hmm. um, and I read, uh, I suppose suspense and literary fiction are my favourites, but look, it could be um, science fiction or, or fantasy or even um, a romance. Ro romance is not something that I generally used to read but since being in the writing community I've, I've had a taste of some you know really fantastic romances and I've mm -hmm. been you know drawn into that world as well but anything that that, that kind of can lure you in with um, maybe it's the characters or the style of the writing or or whatever it is I think just being taken into a different world is is what I look for uh, really when I pick up a book to read. Fantastic.
Well, books are the ultimate passport, really, aren't they? <laughs> well, they are. true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, too true. Naomi, thank you so much for having a quick chat to us. I can't wait to read your domestic suspense novel, which is debuting in 2023. And I noticed you're not putting a title out there. So don't feel obliged to tell us. But, you know, when you're, you're ready, you know, for it to be published, please come back and share uh, the whole box and dice of the publication with us. I certainly will. No, we're still, I did have a working title, but uh, mm -hmm. we, we've got a, a new title um, in progress. So I'll, I'll definitely let, let you know uh, once that's been decided. Excellent. Excellent. And, and now, Naomi, before you, you go, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was yeah. just to say, don't forget to finish your champagne cocktail before you go. Oh. And, and, and not only that, um, just yeah. curious, if you were only able to have uh, one Japanese dish from here on in, what would it be? Oh, goodness. Um, probably teriyaki beef. I don't think you can go past that. That's, well, that's, that's a pretty good choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pretty damn good. Oh, golden curry would be mine, the old street version of golden <laughs> curry. But yes, teriyaki beef. Yeah, yes. you definitely get my vote for that one as well. Thank you for enjoying a drink with us in the Writer's Lounge, Naomi. And uh, thank you so much for all the reviews you've done. And I suspect we'll be talking to you uh, at a greater length not too distant future regarding your new release. That would be wonderful, Darren. Thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. And I hope you enjoyed the jazz. I did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Thanks, Veronica. Bye. So delighted to talk to Naomi. It is so lovely to have her live on the show and she's got some more great reviews coming up and wish, we wish her all the very best with her publication of her suspense domestic thriller, which is really yes. good. Yes, 2023 is the year, so keep tuned and her book will be out. Uh, well, I'm sure she's going to tell us the release date when she gets a little bit more information. But yes, so there we go. Yeah. Stuff coming out this year, stuff coming out next year, authors everywhere, books everywhere, writing, reading. It's all happening. Um, it is. You know, Post-COVID, I just love it. And, you know, congratulations to Naomi for having the release coming out next year. And it's just a fantastic uh, opportunity to have a quick chat with her in our beautiful Writers' Lounge. Indeed it was. Now let's go to some quotes and I chose a quote that harks back to uh, S.S. Turner uh, and his book Secrets of a River Swimmer. And I do actually like, and this is not my turn to quote, okay, this is just he's got on his website, I just write the words, don't ask me what they mean. And I think that's, that's mm. good because people yeah. will find their own meaning as we've kind of talked about it. But anyway, she says quickly going to her quote, this is a quote by Catherine Mansfield. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Catherine Mansfield Murray was a New Zealand writer, essayist and journalist, and widely considered one of the most influential and important authors of the modernist movements. And her works are celebrated around the world and been published in 25 languages. Uh, she was born in Wellington, New Zealand in 1888. That's a great number. Uh, she died in 1923 in Fontainebleau in France. So with all of that as a preface, her quote is, I want by understanding myself to understand others. I want to be all that I am capable of becoming. Hmm. Yeah, very, uh, well, it was a big mountain to climb, isn't it, to know ourselves yeah. and yeah, yeah. And, and, to, and by extension, by knowing ourselves, we can understand other people more eloquently, I suppose, or on a deeper and spiritual and cosmic level. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd love to be able to know myself better. I don't know if I would like myself if I knew myself <laughs> better, but... Uh... I'd be horrified. Yeah, horror writer. No, not true. No. You would find that there there are many, many things uh, about you that are absolutely delightful. Well, that well, uh, that's to be confirmed. But yeah, no, that's a be beautiful <laughs> quote. A real beautiful quote. It is a beautiful quote, isn't it? So what have you got for us? I've actually got one that, uh, well, I think you're going to like it. It's from none other than Terry Pratchett. And uh, uh -huh. in, the, in the spirit of your interview with Mr. S.S. Turner and mm -hmm. the idea of adventure and, and the insights that can come with, you know, I guess taking the plunge to no pun intended. Uh, so the quote is, why do you go away so that you can come back so that you can see the place you came from with new eyes and extra colors and the people there see you differently too. Coming back to where you started is not the same as never leaving. 
uh, so by Terry Pratchett. And I think that's that, uh, very true. Yeah, I think. that is a very true. And it's excellent because it it really wraps up adventure and self-discovery all at once. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, I've had the opportunity a couple of times to sort of come back, so to speak, come back home after being mm-hmm. away for long, long bouts of time. And uh, it, it's absolutely true. You see the place you came from with new eyes. You definitely see extra colours and... Yeah, it's, it's just something that, uh, yeah, I wish everyone can experience. And and I, I guess if they can't do it physically, jump into a book. You can do it through there. Yeah, well, exactly. And so if you are a great book reader, you need to jump onto australianbooklovers.com. And if you go forward slash book lovers, join the newsletter subscriber list and you are in the running for some great book giveaways. So we have got The Tilt by Chris Hammer and we've also got The Liars by Petronella McGovern Ooh. and I just finished listening to that on all audiobook it was fantastic really loved it and of course it was up on the east coast of New South Wales here the um where the book was set so it's all about what's happening <laughs> in New mm. South Wales at the moment so yes australianbooklovers.com forward slash book lovers and subscribe and if you don't want to subscribe, just jump on and have a look at all the brilliant books that are on the website, all by Australian authors. If you are an Australian or Indigenous author and you'd like to list your book with us for free and have us yabber about it on the show, then head to australianbookclubbers.com forward slash for authors and send all the details about your book or throw in a short story uh or some poetry so all of those things are available whatever you would like to do but speaking of whatever we'd like to do have you any ideas i've got some ideas have you got any ideas for the tagline for the episode number 70 i I must stop leaving it to you because even though you come up with good ideas i think i'll have to try next time to think about that so what have you got for us well i'm thinking maybe we can be scuba divers communicating (laughs) via radio underwater with bubbles looking at whales Right, good plan. And, yeah, so we're like, <laughs> I don't know how it does. I'll, I'll work out that proper you, you, effect. You, okay, good, good, good. But and we'd be very slow, tempered breathing. Excellent. Now stay tuned because, of course, after this we'll have a book review and don't forget next episode we're going to be um, bring you the chat with Chris Hammer, which is fantastic. So yes, that will be exciting. episode 71. Amazing. But for now... Take care and remember to Hopefully everyone just felt they were underwater for a moment in time. Oh. I don't, I'm not confident that that's yeah, what the effect that. I, we'll, I think we'll I was see. trying to channel Dory out of, um, you know, Finding Nemo, but I don't think it was working. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being a part of Episode 70. You are all amazing and can't wait to uh, be back in your ears for Episode 71, where we're going to get right down to all things crime and mystery in the, uh, well, in, in the terrain of Australia and, uh, yeah, maybe delve into uh what 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 makes a good murder or who knows you'll have to tune in for that chat with chris hammer in the meantime take care everybody bye for now hi i'm naomi shippen stories have always been an important part of my life but it was not until recent years that i began writing my own Mystery, suspense and domestic noir hold a special fascination for me and I also love to read memoir. You can find out about my writing on my website, naomishippen.com and you can follow me on social media on Twitter at Naomi Shippen, Instagram at naomi.shippen.writes and Facebook at nshippen. Today I would like to review Michelle Tom's debut memoir, 10,000 Aftershocks, and just as a trigger warning, there are some descriptions of domestic violence. 10,000 Aftershocks is about Michelle Tom's turbulent childhood growing up in New Zealand and of the life she created for herself as an adult in Australia. 
After the Christchurch earthquakes in 2011, Michelle and her young family were overwhelmed by recurring aftershocks and so made the decision to move to the safer ground of Melbourne, Australia. The earthquake motif running throughout the novel provides a striking metaphor for the volatile nature of Michelle's family of origin. Just as a young Michelle never knew if the earth was going to split open beneath her feet, so too she never knew when her sleep would be broken by the sounds of violence from her parents in the next room or when the next blow was going to fall on her siblings or herself. The story is told in a braided narrative that darts through time and place, reflecting the chaos of Michelle's early life. This structure is true to her consciousness with the past and present inexorably intertwined. The family members Michelle has lost are never far from her thoughts, and she writes about their short lives and untimely deaths with sensitivity and grace. She recreates the time leading up to their deaths moment by moment, and in doing so honours their lives and ensures they will not be forgotten. But despite the tragedy, Michelle tells her story with humour and an underlying feeling of hope. Her descriptions of her charismatic parents, eccentric grandmother, feisty sister and tender younger brother are vivid and often very funny. Her love for them and the complexity of their relationships comes through despite the difficulty they had in living as a family. Michelle's road to finding peace has not been an easy one, nor was her decision to cut ties with her mother. Recognising her mother's own struggles, Michelle detaches from her with love and relinquishes any societal notions of the way their relationship should be. She allows the estrangement to grow over time to the point where contact dwindles to non-existence. By the end of the book, both mother and daughter are free of any lingering obligation they may have felt towards each other and go on to live their lives in fulfilment and peace. 10,000 Aftershocks is ultimately a story of hope and of building a new life from the ruins of an old one. Even while reading about her darkest times, I always knew that Michelle's humour, resilience and adventurous spirit would see her through. And fortunately, I was right. Let's meet again. Where magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.